I believe in the sun. I believe in the risen one. I believe I overcome by the power of his blood.
victorious. Faithfulness none can deny through the storm and through the fire. There is truth that sets me free. Jesus Christ who lives in me. You are strong.
God, we're in so much awe of you and your power and your glory. After we celebrate your resurrection, Lord, that you would die for us, that more for that you would rise from the grave. It shows how powerful and how worthy of our praise you are. More like the rain we have right now. Kind of unhappy that it's raining right now. We have to walk out in the rain, Lord, Lord but kind of like your love, Lord. It's in great abundance. We have way much more rain than we need, just like we have much more love than we could ever have, than we could ever need, than you've given us. Be with the offering that uh, is going to be taken up soon, Lord. I pray that people give in their hearts, Lord, give obediently, and I pray that you honor them for that. I pray that you use this money, people's offerings, for your glory, that we can use them for your glory. Thank you for everything you've done for us, from dying, rising from the grave, saving us from our sins, Lord. Thank you for everything you've done for us. Thank you, thank you, thank you, guys and gal. Appreciate that. Leading us in worship today. So very much. I'm sure most of us have a favorite Bible story. Stories we first learned as children as they were read to us or stories that we learned about in Sunday school or Bible school, stories that we replay in our minds occasionally, uh, stories like Noah's Ark, think about that one today, <laughs> David and Goliath, Daniel and the lion's den, Samson, now there's a story, but for me there's no greater story, better story than the story of Jonah. 
Jonah is probably the story in the Bible that is best known and least understood of all of the biblical stories. Three main characters in Jonah. There's the fish, and there's Jonah, and there's God. And the fish is only mentioned four times, or the whale, whatever you prefer. Jonah's only mentioned 18 times, but God is mentioned 38 times. So Jonah is ultimately a book about God. It's not just the mention of God that makes him the hero of the book and the main focus of the book, but it's the mercy of God that we see in the book of Jonah and then ultimately the mission of God. Jonah is our focus for Bible school in a month or so, and so we're going to be working through the book on Sundays as we get ready to work through the book in our Bible school, which we're calling Big Fish, Big God. So let's find the book of Jonah this morning. If you don't know where it is, just find Obadiah and turn right. (laughs) Jonah. One of the twelve minor prophets. Not minor because it's not important, but minor because it's smaller than the major prophets of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. The book of Jonah. The book of Jonah is not about what happens in the belly of a fish or in the mind of a man, but the book of Jonah is about what happens in the heart of God. It's about God's heart for sinners, lost sinners, people in Nineveh, but also saved sinners, people like Jonah. And if you had any experience, sometimes lost sinners are more receptive to God than saved sinners are. And that's another thing that Jonah is going to show us. The Bible says something that modern man doesn't like to hear. No man ever liked to hear it, but modern man especially doesn't like to hear it. Postmodern man, if you're into philosophy, is that we've all sinned. The Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us are sinners. We're either lost sinners or saved sinners. We get to decide which kind of sinner we want to be. God loves sinners. He sent His Son to save sinners. Romans 5.8 says God commended His love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if we believe that in our heart the Lord Jesus and confess with our mouth that God has raised Him from the dead, we'll be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 13. Whosoever, put your name in there, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Acts chapter 16, a man that worked at the prison said to Paul, What must I do to be saved? And Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And that's what it's all about. And Jonah was going to be used by God to proclaim that mighty message, that old story that never grows old, the good news of God's grace and God's mercy to save sinners like you and I. Jonah is about God's heart for sinners like you and me. We wouldn't like to admit it, but we're just like Jonah. There's a little Jonah in all of us, and there's a lot of Jonah in some of us. And You're going to see yourself as we go through this book over the next several weeks. Now, what kind of story is Jonah? Well, number one, it's a true story. It's a real story. Several proofs for that. I have to talk about that because there's many Bible people and skeptics and critics that would say Jonah is a parable. Jonah is a fable. Jonah is like three little pigs or uh, Red Riding Hood or Robin Hood or one of the hoods. It's, Jonah is something like that. It's not, it's not a real story. But there are five specific proofs that tell us that Jonah is a true story. First of all, the Bible says so. Here's a book bearing his name. He's also mentioned in 2 Kings 14.25 as a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel. His father's name is mentioned there in that verse. His father's name is Amittai. Also, his hometown is mentioned. Beth Gath Hefer. There I got it out. Not too far from Nazareth where Jesus spent his boyhood. So the Bible says Jonah is a real story. It's a true story. Jewish history also says that Jonah is a true story. He 
preached, he prophesied during the reign of King Jeroboam II, a biblical king, a Jewish king to the northern kingdom, the twelve tribes, commonly known as Israel in uh, kingdom speak. And so just as Jeroboam was a real person, a real king, Jonah was a real person, a real prophet. His story is a real story. So Jewish history says Jonah was real. And church history says he was real too. Fascinating. The first three centuries, the New Testament church, the church was heavily persecuted by Rome. The church had to go underground, and they met in caves and catacombs. And archaeologists have been into these catacombs, and they find these paintings, these murals on the walls, which they would use to teach the Bible stories and to, to disciple and, and to, to, to tell over and over because there were no Bibles much at that time, no New Testaments especially. And the three top Bible stories they have found on these caves, number three, Genesis 22, where Abraham offered up Isaac unto the Lord. And then God provided the lamb, Jehovah Jireh. You remember that story. The second, David and Goliath. But the number one, the most popular Bible story they found on the cave walls is the story of Jonah. Interesting, fascinating. So he was believed by and preached in church history. Not only does the Bible say so that it's a true story, and Jewish history say so that it's a real story, and church history say so that it's a true story, but modern history as well. We don't know when Jonah died, but Jonah was buried in Mosul, about 300 miles north of Baghdad in modern Iraq. A Christian church was erected near his tomb, and it became a Christian shrine until July the 24th, 2014, when Jonah's tomb was blown up by ISIS. Yeah, and it's not there anymore. ISIS said, they declared a statement, I wrote it down, CNN had it on the news at that time. The church of Jonah, it wasn't Jonah's church, but they called it the church of Jonah, is not a place of prayer, it is a place of apostasy. So church history, modern history, Jewish history, the Bible. Fifthly, this caps it for me, Jesus says Jonah's a true story. Now Jesus says it, I'm all right with that. All the other is just icing on the cake. Jesus is the cake. In Matthew 12, 40, Jesus Christ uses the story of Jonah as proof or as a picture of his resurrection. So if Jesus believed Jonah was real and his story was real, then I'm going to get in line with Jesus. So it's a, it's a real story. It's a true story. Number two, it's a short story. <laughs> I like short stories. I like books that are 100 pages or less, and it's even better if they got pictures. <laughs> When I was in Bible college and seminary, you have to read these massive books. You have to read 30 pages to find three lines worth remembering. But Jonah, four chapters. That's all it is, four chapters. Uh, 48 verses. About 1,300 words, depending on what version you read. You can read it in 15 minutes or less. Uh, the world of literature says a short story is, quote, a story less than 5,000 words with a fully developed theme. So that's Jonah. I think a great short story is one that you can read in one sitting and remember for a lifetime. Now that's Jonah. So it's a, it's a true story. It's a short story. Number three, it's a convicting story. Think about the, the basic plot of the story of Jonah. Jonah was God's man. I mean, he's a preacher. Jonah heard God's plan. Jonah said, no way. Jonah went the opposite way, and yet God used Jonah anyway to bring about the greatest recorded revival in the history of planet Earth. Interesting. Jonah is a convicting book because at the end, in spite of all his disobedience and in spite of all his success, Jonah is mad because God is good. And the book ends with a question mark. Have you ever noticed that? Only two books in the Bible end with a question mark. I'm not going to tell you what the other one is. I'm going to make you look it up for yourself. But it also involves the people of Nineveh, the people of Assyria. But we're sort of left at the end of the book wondering about Jonah. Which way did he go? 
Question mark. Let me give you a quick outline. Jonah chapter 1, running from God. Jonah chapter 2, praying to God. Jonah chapter 3, speaking for God. And Jonah chapter 4, learning about God. So let's read chapter 1 and then make two or three pertinent comments before we eat our lunch. How about that? Jonah chapter 1. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh. You may have a version that just says go. That's okay, but literally it means get up and go. They're all in the imperative. It's a command from God. Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city. And it was great in three different ways. I'll talk about that in chapter 3 when we get there. That great city and cry against it. For their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What do you mean, O sleeper? Arise, call upon your God, if so be that God will think upon us that we do not perish. And they said every one to his fellow, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. And they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What's your occupation? Where do you come from? What's your country? What people are you? And he said unto them, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which has made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do to you, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea was wrought with uh, tempestuous. And he said to them, Take me up, cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring it to the land, but they could not. For the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life. Lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah, cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Wow. Jonah was called to go to Nineveh and speak a message there in verse Uh, 1 and 2. The message Jonah was called to proclaim was not, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. (laughs) Jonah's message was not Joel Osteen's message, your best life now. Jonah's message was turn or burn. You guys better get right or God's going to come down on you like you've never seen before. So it was a message of judgment. Why? Why would God send a prophet of God to a people without God to proclaim a message of judgment from God? Well, it's hinted at there in verse 2. He says, Go to Nineveh, cry against it for their wickedness. It's come up before me or unto me. Now that's a very strong statement only used a handful of times in the Bible. The first time we saw it was when it was Noah's time. The wickedness of man came up and God said, I'm going to destroy everything with a flood and we're thankful He's not going to do it again. (laughs) And so that's one of the times. And there are several other times where wickedness of people, like in Solomon and Gomorrah, some of the Bible stories, where a people became so wicked, God waited patiently so long for a people to turn from their wickedness, to turn to Him, that the wickedness became so great that the symbolism is it goes all the way up and there's nothing to stop God from judging this people. Now at this time in the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, they had two major enemies. They had the Babylonians 
and the Assyrians. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Babylon is modern-day Iraq. Assyria, basically modern-day Iran. Not quite boundary-wise, but about the same difference. Iran came from Persia as well. So the Babylonians, their method of conquering their enemies was assimilation. What the Babylonians did, they would come in with their armies, they would besiege a city, they would knock the walls down, they would come in, they would kill a few people, they would burn a few things down, they, they would do this and that. But mostly what the Babylonians would do would take the best and leave the rest. They would take the best looking. They would take the most athletic. They would take the smartest. They would take those they thought could become great Babylonians to make the Babylonian race stronger, smarter, better. And they would just leave the rest, the old, the infirm, the sickly, the ones that look like me. They would leave them back there in Babylon to fend for themselves amongst the burning and the rubble. You remember Daniel chapter 1 perfect example. Daniel and his three friends, they were teenagers. They were taken from Jerusalem back to Babylon. There they were given Babylonian names. There they were commanded by the king to eat the Babylonian meat which had been offered to the Babylonian gods. But Daniel said, O king, we don't want to eat any of your Babylonian baloney. <laughs> Give us vegetables. That's not kosher for us. We're good Jewish boys, Hebrew boys. And they made a test out of it. Do you remember the story? And after 10 days, they looked finer than all the Babylonian boys. That's because they was eating that, raunchy, that rancid meat back there in that day. But that's what the Babylonians would do. They would conquer people by assimilation. They would take people and make good Babylonians out of them. The Assyrians didn't use that method. The Ninevites didn't use that method. The Ninevites, the Assyrians, are recorded by all history as the most cruel nation that's ever existed, including Hitler in the Third Reich, and that's saying something. What the Assyrians did was not assimilation, but extermination. There are several records in the Bible, there are several extra-biblical records of the, the cruelty of the Assyrians. They would take hooks, and they would put hooks in the jaws of the people they conquered, and they would put them on a stringer, like a stringer of fish, and they would pull them and parade them through a city to let people see, you don't mess with Assyria. You don't mess with the Ninevites. They would take every male, child, adult, elderly man, cut their heads off, and then make pyramids of the heads so when people passed by, they could see, you don't mess with Assyria. And I won't mention what they did with the women. I won't even talk about that in mixed company. But this hooks in the jaws and these pyramids. And the most wicked thing they did, they'd impale people on a pole and then they'd skin them while they were alive and then they'd wrap the skins around their body as a sense of we conquered you. They'd take the skins of men and hang them up on a wall like you hang up the skin of some animal you shot and killed. They were wicked. They were cruel. And here in verse 2 it says, their wickedness has come up before me. So sometimes we have people that look at the God of the Old Testament and think He's some kind of mean, evil, uh, judgment kind of a God. But God's waited a long, long time for these Assyrians to turn to Him. He sent rain. He sent sun. He's provided crops. They've got families. They're people with needs. And God is providing for the heathen just as well as He provides for His own. God's providing for lost sinners today just as well as He's providing for saved sinners today because God loves people. God loves sinners. And God wants these Assyrians to get right. And He's going to give them one more chance. And His name is Jonah. <laughs> Oh my, oh my. So in response to verse 2, their wickedness, God calls Jonah to call the Ninevites to repentance. God says, go. Jonah says, no. <laughs> Jonah says, God, they are wicked. God, they don't deserve forgiveness. God, the only thing they deserve is punishment. God, I hate them because they hate me. They hate my people. They hate my nation. And I'm not going. <laughs> and that's the background of Jonah. So Jonah does go, but he goes in the opposite direction. He doesn't go God's way, but his way. He goes the wrong way. Jonah's in Israel. And God says, I want you to go 500 miles to the east, to Nineveh. And Jonah decides he's going to go 2,000 miles to the west to Tarshish, which is modern-day Spain. 
Now, if you know your geography, you know your map, Spain's as far as you can go at that time. I mean, he's going to go just as far as he can go uh, to, to run from God, to get out of God's way, to do what he wants. So Jonah's running from God. Jonah is disobedience. Disobedient. What does that look like? Look at the text with me. Disobedience. Three things here that happens when you run from God, when you disobey. Number one, disobedience is always down. Look at verse 3. Jonah found the ship. He paid the fare. And he went down into it. Look at verse 5 towards the end. Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship. And he was fast asleep. Verse 12, he said, take me up and cast me forth into the sea. That's down. (laughs) He just keeps going down. Verse 15, they took up Jonah and cast him forth down into the sea. In verse 17, he winds up in the belly of a big fish. Now you can't get any more down than that. So when you disobey, when God says, I want you to do thus and so, I want you to go here or there, and you say no, and you run from God, disobedience always takes you down. Mark it down, write it down, jot it down, you're going down when you turn and go your own way. So disobedience is down. Number two, disobedience involves the devil. Look at verse three. It's interesting. Whenever we run from God, whenever we disobey, the devil is always willing to provide us a ship. The devil's always there to provide a way He wanted to go to Tarshish, so he went down there by the dock, and he just happened to find a ship from Tarshish. Imagine that. Just happened to be one there. And he paid the fare, and the price is always higher than you think it's going to be when you disobey God. But the devil is always involved. See, God has a will for your life and my life, but so has the devil. He has a will too. So choose wisely. Jesus said it this way in John 10.10, The thief, the devil, he comes to steal, to kill, and destroy... But I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So just as God has a plan for your life and He wants you and I to obey Him and trust Him and do what He says, the devil has a will too to destroy you. To destroy your life, to destroy your family, to destroy your kids, to destroy you. So disobedience always involves the devil. The first disobedience in the Bible, Adam and Eve, what's the first thing the devil said? Did God really mean what He said? The devil's always involved in disobedience. So it's down. It takes you down. Down, down, down. It involves the devil. And thirdly, disobedience is deceptive. Many years ago when I was reading the book of Jonah, I came up with a question. If Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, then why did Jonah go the other way? If Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, why didn't he just stay where he was? Think about that. He didn't have to go anywhere. He just could have said, no, God, I'm staying put. But he goes in completely the opposite direction. You see, Jonah was deceived in the worst way. He was self-deceived. That's the worst deception there is. Now, the devil will deceive you. That's bad. People will sometimes deceive you. That's worse. But when you deceive yourself... Can't get any worse than that. What do I mean? Jonah thinks his problem is with Ninevites. Jonah thinks his problem is with Assyrians. Jonah thinks, like some of us think, our problem is with our neighbors. Jonah thinks, like some people think, it's my brother-in-law. No. Jonah's problem is not with Ninevites. Jonah's problem is with God. Jonah's not running from the Ninevites. Jonah is running from God. He doesn't know that yet. He's going to find out. Jonah's problem is that he doesn't want to do what God wants him to do. He doesn't want to see things God's way. He doesn't want to go God's way. And so he's running from God. Disobedience. Very deceptive. We start running from God. So let me conclude with three questions. Three questions of application. You may want to jot these down. Think these over. Pray these in. Work these out. When we say no, when we run from God, how far will He let us go? 
When God says, I want you to do thus and so, I want you to stop this or that, I want you to go here or there, I want you to obey me in this way, and we turn and go the opposite way, how far will He let us go? Apparently, He let us go pretty far. I mean, Jonah's at the bottom of the deep blue sea in the belly of a great big fish. You can't get more down than that. You can't get more away from God than that. I mean, he's down as far as you. He's on the bottom as low as you can go. And many times, the judgment of God is not active. It is passive. Sometimes God, instead of actively judging a person, disciplining one of His children, coming down on a nation, sometimes God will just take His hands off. It's like the great quote from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said that hell is man saying to God, leave me alone! And God saying to man, you have your wish. So it's something to think about. How far will He let us go? I don't know. Second question. When we say no, when we run from God, why doesn't He stop us? Here I'm going the wrong way. I'm going to enter into sin. I'm going to disobey God. He sees me. He's all-powerful. He loves me. He's all-knowing. Why doesn't He stop me? I don't know. Maybe He's waiting for us to turn around and turn back to Him. So that's a question to think about too in this book. How far will He let a sinner go? A lost sinner or a saved sinner like Jonah? When we disobey, why doesn't He stop us? Why doesn't He do something? Why does He let us go on? Doesn't He care? Isn't He there? Third and final question. Are you running from God? So well, I'm in church. Jonah was a preacher. <laughs> Have you said no to God? Have you been saying no to Him in some area of your life? Are you just like Jonah today? Living in disobedience? It's been a while, but if you've been here any length of time, you've heard this before. It's my very simple definition of obedience. Two words. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Is God speaking to you about something in your life, but you're unwilling to say yes, Lord? You're saying no, Lord? See, realistically, you can't say no and Lord together unless you don't understand what it means to say Jesus is Lord. Because if He is Lord, you can't say no, Lord. If He is Lord, you can only say yes, Lord. The old adage is he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And that's the story of Jonah. Jonah said, he's my Lord, but I'm going this way. He's my Lord, but I'm not going to do what he said. He's my Lord, but I'm not going to do that. He's my Lord, but I'm not going to follow him. He's my Lord, but I'm not going to obey him. See how asinine that is? Arrogant that is? Sinful that is? But that's what Jonah's doing. And guess what? There's a little bit of Jonah in all of us. And there's a lot of Jonah in some of us. We're just like Jonah more than we'd like to admit. So are you running from God today? If you are, stop running from God. Turn around. Start running to God. And you'll run smack dab into God. He's waiting for you. He's working on your behalf. Just like He is for Jonah as we'll see throughout this book. Poet Thomas Carlyle said it this way in his work on Jonah. Quote, Jonah was waiting for God to come around to his way of thinking while God was waiting for Jonah to come around to his way of loving. I like that. I'm going to repeat that. Jonah was waiting for God to come around to his way of thinking while God was waiting for Jonah to come around to his way of loving. God was waiting for Jonah, and God's waiting for some of us. God may be waiting for you today to stop running, stop disobeying, and to turn to Him and say, yes, Lord. 
I want to invite you to come this morning as the band comes to do our final song. God is calling you to turn to Him, to stop running away, to trust Him as Savior, to make Him your Lord, some other decision in your life. You come as they sing. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask now that You draw, that You convict through the Holy Spirit those who are coming, those who need to come, those who need to come back to Jesus, those who need to get right with Jesus, those who have drifted and wandered, those whose hearts have grown cold, those whose love has grown lukewarm. Father, convict each one of us that we wouldn't be like Jonah with an arrogant attitude towards those we don't love or don't know or are different than us. Lord, help us to learn from this prodigal prophet that it's easy to become just like Him and to justify our disobedience and to continue to go the wrong way. But we know, God, even this morning, through Your Holy Spirit, You're calling, You're convicting, You're drawing people to You. Some here today may be lost sinners like the Ninevites that need to come to Christ and turn their life over to Him and respond in faith and baptism. Others may be a long time a child of yours, but something's happened. Something's gone wrong and they've been going the wrong direction in their life or in some area of their life, Father. And we just pray, God, as we come to this time of invitation that you would glorify yourself through the response of people to your word. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. You come as we sing. Let's stand together. Amazing grace together. We're going to pray and bless our meal if you're able to stay with us. Wish you would. You say, well, I didn't bring anything. Well, that's all right. There'll be plenty. We'd love to have you. And uh, as we said, nothing tonight because of the weather. Maybe you're going to baccalaureate and uh, be careful out there as you're driving and going. Father, we're just so thankful that you're so full of grace and so full of mercy. And this story of Jonah is such an interesting story because He'd been greatly used by you in the past. But he drew a line and said, I'm not going to do that. Help us, God, if we're in that condition today. If we've come to a point in our walk with you where we've said this far and no farther, and we've stopped walking with you in a practical sense, we've stopped talking to you in a particular sense, and we've become religious, we've become church members, we're just going through the motions. We're not really following you. 
because we're not obeying You. We're not reaching people for Jesus. We're not reaching out to people that need to know. We're not burdened about lost souls in our own family sometimes. And help us, God, to do a deep search of our hearts so that You can do a deep cleansing in our lives. So we as the people of God can be like Jonah. We can proclaim the fact that we have a Savior. To those who are lost, the Ninevites around us, the people that You've placed in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our workplace, people who are our Nineveh, people who are our mission field. Help each one of us, Lord, to take seriously the fact that You've saved us for a purpose. That's to go to heaven when we die and to tell people about heaven until we die, to live for it, to make it difference, to make it real. Help each one of us, Lord, to learn from the lessons of Jonah so that we may not repeat them, so that we may bring glory and praise to Your holy name. We thank You that You're a God of grace, a God of mercy, and a God of forgiveness. Even when You forgive people that we wouldn't forgive, even when You're merciful to people that we wouldn't think deserved it, even when You're gracious to people that we don't think, well, I could go on. But help us, Father, at Oak Grove Baptist Church to get serious about the fact that we have a mission, we have a cause, we have a gospel to proclaim. Help each one of us, Lord, to walk with You, to talk with You, to work for You, to serve You, and to follow You. Because You're an awesome God, a mighty God, who has saved us with the blood of Your Son and the resurrection from the dead. We thank You and praise You for the worship we've had today. And now we pray for the meal that's been prepared for us. Thank You for everybody that worked in the kitchen this morning. Those who have been down in the nursery taking care of babies so we could be up here and have this worship service, Lord. And I pray for those that can't stay for one reason or another that You bless them, give them a good rest of the day. And for those of us that can, help us to eat, to laugh, to rejoice, and have a good time of fellowship together. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. God bless you if you're going. God bless you if you're